Thank you again for having me out. I really appreciate it. I'm going to give a very short speech, and then I'd like to turn it over to questions and answers. I think that you all will have questions, and I like to uh, spend most of the time focused on what people would really like to hear about, because there's a lot of uh, aspects to this. If you don't have questions, I'll go into different detail. Uh, so here's the uh, introductory part. I'm going to make a series of radical claims, and when you first hear them, they're going to seem too good to be true, impossible, can't happen, and your first impression is correct. With the way that our government and the people and things are set up here in California right now, they are impossible. But with a shift in the government and the people to a new form of government, which is what the book is about, all of this does become possible. First, the radical claims. Um, one, half of your taxes cut away. Half of the bureaucracy on all businesses in California cut away. The debt of California, somewhere between 10 to 20 billion, removed within the year, 100,000 extra jobs, increased trade for America, greater global security, a recession-proof economy for California, the best roads, schools, bridges, seaports, airports in California for the first time in four decades, and a qualitative jump in the quality of leadership for all political positions and all government positions here in California like you've never seen before. Plus, a return to local control at the county and city level like you haven't seen since the 1960s. Let me throw in a couple more. Um, it would move us out of our current recession and secure us for the next century. It would also make the world more secure and America and California at the same time. Right, right, I know, radical. Here's how it's possible, and this is what the book goes into detail. By the way, the name of the book is California's Next Century. I should have said that up front. This speech will explain what the title's about, etc. The world's changing right now in a way that it hasn't in a while. Quick history lesson. World War II ends. America and Europe, Western powers, democracy, capitalism. On the Eastern side, the Soviet Union. It's been that way for the last 70, 80 years. Communism fell. Everybody around the world now realizes that capitalism and some form of democracy, give or take, is the way to go. Now you have China, India, Brazil, Russia, and Southeast Asia in the next 20 to 40 years guaranteed will have as much money as America today. The last 70 years since World War II was basically America as a superpower and the Soviet Union as a superpower with very different ideologies. Now we're going to have six to eight superpowers with the same ideology, money. But here's the thing, China, Russia, Brazil, even the EU and possibly a Southeast Asian collective, they have very different cultures. Their interpretation of democracy and progress is different. Now they do like making money and they will sell products, but as you can see, China makes a lot of products right now and does not have a government similar to America's. So what happens when China is as rich and powerful as America in 20 years? Take it a step further. What happens when there's five other countries that don't act and think like America with as much money and power as America? Going to happen in the next 20 to 40 years. Well, we can look at history. The last time that we saw rising superpowers quickly coming and trying to conquer parts of the globe for themselves, 1880 to 1910, the lead up to World War I and World War II. Some people consider those one long war. What happened then was England, Germany, France, Italy, Russia, they started conquering parts of the world. And then they said, well, you know, this is our part of Angola. This is our part of Latin America. And they started to fight with each other. But someone said, well, let's talk this out. And from basically the late 1700s through the 1800s, and some say even to the 2000s, there was a city called Geneva, Switzerland, 
where all of the world superpowers met and they discussed all their business deals, all their political deals. If you look at all of the major negotiations on shipping, telephones, business, internet, over the last 100 years, they were all almost signed in Geneva, Switzerland, almost all of them. Every major business and political development that the world has agreed upon in the last 100 years and going back to the last 200 years was done in Switzerland. Here's the problem though. The new powers aren't European. Europe's now just one power. And then we have an Asian, Brazilian, Russian, Southeast Asian, and Indian cultures. Very different. And what they're doing is not showing up at the UN, the IMF, the other international institutions that America and Europe made after World War II. Because they don't feel that those institutions designed by Americans and Europeans represent them. India and China have never had a sitting board president or any senior leadership position in the IMF, and yet that's supposed to represent all of them. They don't feel that way. For the last 60 years, every single IMF president and UN uh, oversecretary has either been European or American. So the Russians, the Brazilians, the everybody, they're going, you don't represent us. So here's what they're doing. They're making their own UN. They're making their own trade agreements and they're not inviting America. They're specifically banning America from being in part of their new trade agreement and their UN. Shanghai Cooperation Council is a good example. Russia's doing one because they want their own sphere of influence. So is India, so is China, so is um, Brazil. And Southeast Asia's looking at it. Last time that happened, right before World War I, Japan walked out of the League of Nations. Germany walked out of the UN. They stopped talking. They stopped negotiating. World War I, World War II. We are having a similar pattern now with these new emerging world powers. And I offer in the book, and by the way, everything's cited in the book thoroughly. I offer in the book that we need a new Switzerland for this next century. And I explain in the book how only California of all places and nations in the entire world can fulfill the functions that Switzerland did in the last century, but for this next century. California would be the new global nexus for all political discussions and business negotiations, particularly between the six major superpowers, but all other major countries. And only it can supply that function in the way that Switzerland did. The main deal has to do with trust. If we do this function, and there's a good reason for America to allow it, for all Californians to like this, and for the world to think that it's necessary, then all of those radical claims that I just made a minute ago are actually quite possible. I'll end the speech now and I'll turn it over for questions. Yes, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Switzerland was able to be the center of European negotiation during the period when Europe ruled the earth because the Swiss have been made up of Germans, Italians, French, and a group called Romanche, going back 400 years. Swiss Germans speak German and have historical German culture, but every single Swiss German views themselves as Swiss first and feels commonality with the French and Italian Swiss first over Germany, although they can speak to all Germans. It was this way through World War II. Um, the only German part of Europe that ever fought Hitler Switzerland. They shot down his planes trying to take it over because they said, we're Swiss first. We'll do banking with you, but we're Swiss. We need a country now that has bits of Russian, Chinese, Indian, European, American, Brazilian, and possibly Southeast Asian. And we need a place that has all of these groups that have lived together for a very long time. Switzerland had those four major European languages, German, Italian, French, and then they picked up English. They did this for hundreds of years. So when they said, we want to be a world negotiation center, everybody said, well, I speak your language. I trust your people. The Germans felt comfortable. The Austrians, the French, the Italians, and the British. The Russians had to learn a language, but you know, it's not perfect. It worked, 
and that was the key to Switzerland's success was their demographics. And not just that they had these people, but they had a community of these people living together for centuries. California is the only place in the world that has had all of the new superpowers living together for over a century in California. No place comes even close. There are some places that are somewhat, but by factors, it's us alone. Yes. Absolutely. And I've been spending five years trying to figure out a way to flank that conflict. When you talk about becoming a different country, everybody thinks of secession and the Civil War, war between the states. Here's how this is totally not like that at all. What I'm talking about is subnational sovereignty. That is a term that Scotland invented. In the last five years, Scotland, which has been a state of England for the last 400 years, decided they wanted to be their own country. The military and the dollar stay with England, but every other policy decision, immigration, trade, banking, goes to Scotland. They did this peacefully, they did it through a series of votes, and they did it very recently. I think that we can have that, and here's why. America is already not fulfilling the functions of a federal overseer on California. I cover this in a multitude of ways in the book. Every fire season, we cover it. Who's supposed to cover it? The feds. The national border is supposed to be protected entirely by the feds. That's one of the main governments of all, every national government. Do you know who spends most of the money to protect the California border? It's you. Goods movement, trade coming into the country. Every major nation views imports and goods as a national concern and security for it as a national concern. Do you know who pays to improve the seaports here in California so that they can actually get the goods to America? It's you. They have a special local tax that the truckers pay, but indirectly that means you pay. So the Fed is not covering security, not covering the border, not covering national disasters, not covering our goods movement, and let's talk about our infrastructure. We have, according to the federal government, the worst, just type in the worst comma California on the internet, it'll come up. And these are official federal reports. Roads, schools, dams, levees. Did you know that the levee over Sacramento is as bad as the one in New Orleans before Katrina? They've known about this for eight years. They just didn't want to spend any money on it. By the way, New Orleans just got $200 million. We get nothing for our levy, even though it would, according to the federal government, equal a similar natural catastrophe. We're paying for all these things. They're not. This is their job. A little bit more. Did you know that California has its own insurance oversight and environmental oversight, and that it's the only state in the union that the federal government gave up those powers to California to oversee? They said, we can't handle overseeing insurance and environment. You effectively act as the federal government because you're just too big to handle it. And here's the thing, the Supreme Court just had two Supreme Court justices testify in front of Congress. The Supreme Court's tired of getting cases from the Ninth Circuit District here in California. The California cases for the Supreme Court at the national level are absorbing absorbing 40% of the national court cases. And the Supreme Court is now actively saying they're looking at California has its own district. So the feds are already giving up power and they're already not supplying the roles the national government's supposed to do. But here's the main key. Unlike all of the other states in the union, you typically, your territory and then you apply for statehood and then you join the union. And the Civil War said, basically, or Abraham Lincoln, once you join the Union, you can't leave. California never voluntarily joined the Union, and neither did Hawaii. They were pre-existing governments recognized by the American government as a foreign government. They had relations for over a century with them, and then they invaded them. That is not the way 49, I'm sorry, 48 other states joined the Union. So the way Hawaii and California did it is illegal according to the way that pretty much the entire rest of the country was put together. Go further back, let's talk about legal precedent. Do you know why America was able to be colonized by the British? Terra nullis. 
It's an old English term that basically means if the land hasn't been improved upon it and you improve upon it, it's yours. All American law is based upon English common law. So when America took over Hawaii and California, they violated the basic English common law that allowed them to conquer all of America in the first place. They're violating the law that allows them to take the 49 other states in two different ways. Third, British legal scholars and the Russian ambassador have said California has a right to be its own country for the reasons I just stated and that they are willing to recognize it. I think for those reasons together and the fact that we aren't talking about it, we have a really good case, at least one that the federal government would sweat to argue against. Yes. Right. 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 Um, so California is a donor state. We give more in federal taxes than we ever get back. Our state budget, and now this is before the recession, the recession screwed up all the numbers. Our state budget to run all the state in California, about $60 billion, $80 billion. When you add all of your federal income taxes and you send it to the feds after we've paid for military, social security, whatever, there's about $60 billion left that you pay taxes to the feds and we never get anything for in this state at all. That money goes to pay for roads, dams, schools, bridges, and 35 other states. If we didn't have to do that, we would have a surplus of $60 billion to start off with, paying off the debt, et cetera. Secondly, if we're shipping goods through California to America, we should start charging the goods as they transit to America like every other coastal community in every other modern nation. That's another revenue source. We also never got our uh, military base cleanup money and we never got our natural disaster money. We're paying for things and we never get the service. If we stop paying for things we never get, we'll have a surplus almost instantaneously. Yes, the recession screws things up. It, the numbers are a little bit fluctuated, but the principle's still there. This situation of you paying one state budget more in federal taxes for things you never see anything for has gone on for 30 years. Chances are it's gonna go on just like it has as soon as the recession's over. That's where the money would come from. Now the infrastructure that you would need to be a world center, we already have. LA's the media capital of the world. Uh, San Francisco's a financial hub of the world. Uh, Los Angeles and Oakland ports are trade ports of the world. The largest airport is Los Angeles. Most of the world knows about tourism in California and all of the major superpowers that I just discussed have a personal relationship with California and are well aware of it. India knows about Sil Silicon Valley. The prime minister of Russia came specifically to California, not America, to talk about how great the business economy was here. Um, Europe routinely has visitors here. America knows us. Brazil, we have an international trade agreement with here. We have the infrastructure we need. We need to improve upon it. But everything Switzerland had when it made that jump, we have even more of that. Yes. Good question, good question. Um, the UN was never designed to be representative of all the powers equally. It was designed for America and Europe to hold on to power after World War II. If we actually do this correctly from scratch, it will be more like Switzerland. And we will be seen as fair because we will design it fairly from the beginning, which never happened with the IMF and the UN, or any of those international institutions built between 1945 and 1955. So my answer is they were all incorrectly built from the beginning. We won't do that now, and it's particularly because of our diversity that we'll be concerned about actually being fair to Chinese and Indian and Russian people, whereas the UN and IMF never were. Um, 
It's a good question. Uh, I would resort power more to the local level and then let the localities decide how strong they want to be union or not. But also, even if there was continued union and what is it, the uh, insurance practices are one of the main things driving businesses out of California, what I'm talking about is cutting all business taxes and all business bureaucracy in half right off the top. That's something no business has ever had. They'll stay, even with other additional problems. Yes. Uh, exactly. This would be a uh, California mass movement vote. So like the way that we have uh, special elections on I particular issues, they would be voted on as the public to make the next step. It wouldn't be in the power of the legislature to oversee each uh, process as it goes along. So you could make sure that the actual will of the people was built into the process moving California forward to be its own in country. That's how they did it in Scotland. And they were able to have actually more democracy for the public like they've never had before. Uh, excellent, excellent point. And, and to add up to everything you guys have said, you know how the media's all owned by like four companies now? That this isn't a fact, I mean a uh, conspiracy theory. And the media companies rate each other on how quickly they cover important news. Important news is determined on what most of the news stations cover. So what most of the news stations cover, it's all about how well you cover that. There is no m diversity in the national media anymore. I totally agree with you. Uh, that's an issue to break through. like this spring up uh, around the country and uh, 